from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan, I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, an exclusive interview with the outspoken CEO of one of the world's biggest crypto exchanges. We'll ask Kraken's Jesse Powell about strategy, sanctions, regulation, and more. And Wall Street's making major moves in crypto, but retail investors appear to be anchored to the sidelines. We'll survey the investing landscape with Pat Labecchia of Oasis Pro Markets. Plus, crypto custody firm BitGo drew an all-cash offer, which exceeds the value of that now terminated deal with Mike Novogratz's Galaxy Digital. We'll have all the details. All right, so all of that is ahead, but first, let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. That is your function, but I have a snapshot of just a few here on the board. We can see it is a down day for the major coins, Bitcoin and Ether, each down a little more than 1%. Bitcoin is trading north, uh, south of that $24,000 level, while Ether is trading south of 1900 Remember, it earlier approached 2000 earlier this week. There's optimism building about the merge next month. However, that is a fading story today. One more positive story out there, though, is the dog coins. Dogecoin in particular up 9.3% on the day speaks to some of that speculative behavior back in the market in certain areas. And finally, just noting Coinbase, it, of course, trades pretty much in tandem with the price of Bitcoin. So it is lower by about 1% today, Matt. And, of course, it's been a rough couple of weeks for Coinbase and also for rivals like exchange Kraken. In July, the New York Times reported that Kraken is being investigated by the Treasury Department over whether it allowed users in Iran to trade on the platform. The Times says the Office of Foreign Assets Control has been looking into Kraken since 2019 and is expected to impose a fine. But Kraken isn't alone. Back in 2020, OFAC fined BitGo more than $98,000 for 183 apparent sanctions violations or alleged sanctions violations. Last year, it fined BitPay more than $500,000 for 2,100 alleged violations. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is Kraken CEO Jesse Powell. And Jesse, I don't think this has been confirmed outside of uh, New York Times reporting. Can you tell us whether or not you are under investigation by the Treasury Department? Uh, I, as far as I know, the New York Times has not confirmed it either. They keep asking us for confirmation. So uh, they're reporting rumors at this point. Um, and we don't generally comment on uh, in investigations or uh, discussions that we're having with regulators. However, I can say that we regularly uh, report things to regulators that we discover ourselves. and. You know, this is, uh, I guess, the speculation that something happened back in 2019, three years ago, and we've been having discussions ever since. You know, we have ongoing discussions with regulators all over the world all the time. Uh, sometimes we yeah. report things to proactively, and, you know, this wouldn't be a surprise to me. And I'd love to see these numbers for the banks, by the way. Well, but on the specific issue of Iran sanctions, have you been contacted by Treasury or any other federal agencies about the possibility of sanctions violations? Again, can't speak to that specifically, but we are in regular discussions with Treasury. Fair enough. Okay, let's talk about sanctions of another kind. In regard to the sanctions on Tornado Cash, how has that impacted Kraken in your business? Uh, hasn't really, as far as we can tell. Um, you know, I, I think that what they've done might be un unconstitutional. It sounds like Coin Center may be gearing up for a challenge uh, on those grounds. Um, you know, I think that people have a right to financial privacy, and there are a lot of legitimate people using this service for legitimate financial privacy reasons. And uh, I, I think that we'll see if this survives a challenge. We, we've heard a lot of um, exchanges have had to freeze um, access to Tornado, and it's happened before with other mixers. Do you have to set in place um, uh, certain procedures when this kind of thing happens? Right, so we, we would pr prohibit withdrawals to any addresses associated with Tornado, and we would likely freeze any uh, funds coming in from a, a Tornado address. Uh, you know, Jesse, this is all goes to kind of the censorship of money, which when I first started getting into Bitcoin back in 2010, the idea was that we would be allowed to go around um, governments that were, uh, that were censoring their fiat currencies. How do you deal with this as a proponent of free speech, as a pr proponent of free movement of money, as a, as a Bitcoin proponent, um, and still work within the regulatory framework of like the U.S. government? 
Yeah, it's a tough challenge. You know, this is why we have these conversations going on all the time. We're really trying to educate regulators and, and law enforcement and uh, the lawmakers about the real risks here and about the real need for financial privacy and who cryptocurrency really serves. And beyond the, the speculative use case here in the United States, it's really helping people all over the world who have less access to financial services. You know, there are billions of people in the world that don't have access to a bank account. So crypto is really for those people, first and foremost. And, um, you know, the, the uh, getting around government controls around the monetary system, you know, is a sort of uh, secondary benefit that, you know, you see you see come into play in cases like Canada, where they've shut down uh, the bank accounts of protesters. You know, that's the kind of scary thing we hope you don't see here in the United States. But uh, that's another kind of insurance policy that cryptocurrency and Bitcoin specifically provides, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll see a, a constitutional challenge uh, against Tornado Cash. And I hope that people get their right to, to publish code and, and uh, that code turns out to be speech and money turns out to be speech and everyone has a right to spend their money however they want. So do you think the sanctions on Tornado Cash are more emblematic of just an attack on open source development as a whole? I don't think so. Um, you know, that, that the code repositories were taken down, you know, is, is I think a step that was not necessary. But, um, you know, I, I don't see a, a widespread attack on open source code. Open source has been around for a long time. Um, you know, people sharing sharing code and, you know, writing code together in, in public view for a long time. There are a lot of benefits to open source code, the transparency, people can evaluate for themselves what's really happening. Um, you know, I think this is mostly like a knee jerk reaction, a hasty response to, to what happened with uh, UST and, and Luna recently. So I think regulators are kind of overreacting, looking to, to protect people. Right. They are looking to protect people. If there's anything that the last couple of months have spotlighted, Jesse, is that there is a lot of risk in these assets and not necessarily many of the protections in place for traditional financial assets. As we like to say, there is no FDIC for crypto. As we think about the liquidity crisis that has faced so many different players in the crypto industry as a whole, how are you feeling about your position? I know you just finished up your audit for 2022. Right. Yeah, we just finished up our, our second audit of the year uh, with the help of Armanino. So this is a full proof of proof of reserves, uh, which is cryptographically done, which allows the users to actually verify for themselves that their balance was included in in the, the pool of funds that we had audited. Uh, so we hope to keep expanding that to even more assets. We had seven assets covered this time. Uh, we'll keep working our way down the list. Um, you know, this is a level of transparency that's not offered in even the banking system. So, you know, I think it's a step up for crypto uh, and setting a great example for, for the world and, you know, giving regulators something uh, to feel comfortable about. Um, in terms of the liquidity in the market, you know, I, I think that uh, the retail investors have maybe uh, pulled back a bit from, from where they were six months ago. Uh, you know, I think a lot of great reasons why. And you know, I think the, the macro environment is really tough right now. Inflation seems to be, you know, out of control. Um, you know, we're, we're by all measurements in a recession here in the United States. So uh, that's to be expected. Obviously, um, when people have more discretionary income, they're making more investments. I think right now people, they've been worried about the price of gas and the price of, of you know, the, the living expenses. When, when, when you look at um, some of the stable coins, which are some of the most widely traded crypto assets in the world, are you concerned about the transparency there? I know that um, regulators want to see more in terms of what Tether or Circle have backing up these one-to-one -one, um, dollar currency claims. Yeah, I think it'd be great to get more transparency there. I think Circle's heavily audited. So, you know, USDC, I think, is, is um, you know, heavily supervised. Uh, Tether may be less so. However, you know, I think, as you just saw, USDC uh, froze a bunch of funds that were out there that were linked to Tornado Cash. And there have been some reports that people were kind of mistakenly frozen in there. So, uh, you know, having a, a digital currency that's so tightly controlled and um, able to be influenced by uh, maybe a hasty and maybe an unconstitutional government action uh, is a little bit scary too. So, you know, I think that um, while we're, we're talking about CBDCs and, and these stable coins, you know, people have to think that there's also this, this risk that, you know, these things can be controlled by the government and, and frozen without, you know, any recourse. O overall, regulation has been a headache, in some ways, obviously helpful, but also the fact that 
um, it's just not defined enough yet is, has been a real headache for investors and exchange operators. How much longer do you think we have, Jesse, on this rocky road before everything's ironed out in terms of, you know, Coinbase is trying to decide whether or the regulators are trying to decide whether Coinbase is trading tokens or securities? That should be something that's pretty easy to tell. You would think so. And we're about 13 years on with uh, Bitcoin now. We still don't have answers from the government on this. You know, I think it's largely a legislative failure. I think the regulators are, are going to read the law uh, to, to increase their scope as much as possible. And as we've seen, um, you know, with the SEC, they really take the view that basically everything is a security and they would like to regulate everything and be the regulator of all crypto companies. Uh, however, you know, I think Coinbase has said that, that they don't list securities. Kraken also does not list securities. So that means there's a disconnect somewhere between our evaluation of what these assets are and, and the SEC's evaluation. Yeah. And I think we need the legislature to clean that up. Okay, so that's evaluation. Let's talk about your valuation because we have seen the valuations of public companies in the crypto sphere, obviously very impacted by the crypto winter. I'm wondering if yours has been affected and what that may mean for any future raises you may be looking at. Yeah, it's hard to know with the private markets. You know, obviously we're, we're not tracking the price uh, uh, on a minute by minute basis like the public markets are. Uh, so it's it's really hard to know. You know, we haven't been out raising capital. We've got uh, a very long runway of cash in the bank. We're profitable. So uh, we don't need to go do another financing anytime soon. I, I think we'll probably wait for the market to improve before we go do another another round. Okay, fair enough. And finally, on the subject of market improvement, I just want to get your take on the price we have seen in these crypto assets, because you were talking back in 2021 about where you thought Bitcoin would end that year and this year. Just take a listen to what you said. Probably by the end of the year, I think it'll be one Bitcoin per Lambo. And probably by the end of next year, it'll be one Bitcoin per Bugatti. So, Jesse, at the end of 2021, it was trading more around $46,000. Today, it's trading south of $24,000, which maybe could buy you a Honda Civic. Hmm. What's your outlook now? Uh, yeah, you know, I wasn't expecting um, all of this crazy uh, craziness in, in the macro environment. However, uh, you know, I'm still hopeful that, that I'll be able to buy a Bugatti by the end of this year uh, for one Bitcoin. But... I wouldn't hold my hopes out. You know, would you even want to pay for the gas uh, for such a car at this point? So, um, you know, I'm still very, I'm still very bullish. I bought in Bitcoin again at, at eighteen thousand, uh, so I'm happy to ride it all the way back up. I'm still very bullish in the long run. You know, the fundamentals keep improving, um, so I would never bet against Bitcoin. Jesse, thanks so much for joining us. Jesse Powell, the CEO of Kraken, talking to us about his business and uh, the business of crypto. One Bugatti, by the way, has 16 cylinders and four turbochargers. Things only Matt Miller knows. The gas would be <laughs> expensive indeed. Coming up, Pat Lavecchia, CEO of U.S. Digital Securities trading platform Oasis Pro Markets. And Novogratz's takeover target is now seeking a $100 million termination fee. More details ahead. To access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Institutional interest in digital asset is far from waning despite what we're seeing in the market. It speaks to institutional customers, very traditional institutional customers, wanting to get crypto asset exposure. It's a validation to the industry, to blockchain and digital assets. It should be fascinating to watch how Bitcoin volumes start to gradually move higher over the next year or so before they maybe all of a sudden jump as more institutions do begin to pour into the space because of that integration ease. Different market participants welcoming institutional interests in digital assets. Let's talk more about that now. Pat Lavecchia, CEO of Oasis Pro Markets, a U.S. digital securities trading platform, is joining us right here on set in our New York studio. Pat, great to see you. There seems to be a sense now about institutional buy-in, being mm -hmm. resilient even in the face of a crypto winter. It seems, though, that retail is staying on the sidelines, a bit more hesitant to a certain extent. And I'm wondering what you're seeing in activity and and especially those institutional flows, if you think they're sticky? Uh, great question. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, retail is down about 50% uh, in terms of volume over the last uh, 
month or so. Um, so the soft retail is gone on the institutional front. It, uh, volumes are down about 40% in terms of um, crypto, right? Bitcoin and ETH and, and that trading in the alts. Um, what we're seeing is on the high frequency trading side, that volume is picked up. And the guess is, it's more than a guess, but the view is that um, what's occurring is late, latency arbitrage. Basically, um, mispricings between exchanges. So the high frequency traders are picking their spots and that's a big part of the uh, uh, big part of the um, uh, volume that you're seeing it's, out there. It's, you say it's more than a guess because obviously you've got a ton of data mm -hmm. from Oasis Pro to back it up. Tell us about your, um, what do you call it, uh, alternative trading system sure. and how your regulated alternative trading system is different from others. Yeah, a absolutely. Um, so Oasis Pro Inc., our holding company, is a fintech and blockchain company. Oasis Pro Markets is uh, the digital investment bank of the future with an ATS. An ATS is an alternative trading system. ICE started as an ATS, as an example. Um, what and makes now owns the NYS exactly, the and that's where iconic <laughs> trading system in the world. Huh? So, so it started. So we're an ATS digital blockchain using the evolution of technology to the blockchain, which is really exciting. We can talk about that if you'd like. But what we can do is, and, and what differentiates us is digital cash for digital securities trading. So what's called an atomic swap. When you're trading crypto today, what's occurring is uh, you're, you're trading crypto for crypto, digital wallet to digital wallet, and it happens almost instantaneously. We can do that on our ATS with stable coins like USDC and DAI, for example, CBDCs. We're actually registered for CBDCs when and if they come, as well as certain cryptos such as Bitcoin and ETH. You could take your holdings in a digital wa wallet and actually buy digital securities. The benefits of blockchain are uh, instantly from no T3 or T2 for you. T, T, you know, I'd like to say T0, but there's a company out there with that name. So <laughs> T seconds or milliseconds. Uh, absolutely. And in 10 years, we're going to look back and this is going to be ubiquitous in the markets. The institutions are in this market right now and they're building for it. Um, some of the benefits of blockchain versus, you know, um, the current systems, which are built on servers from really 1973, is no counterparty risk. So remember uh, AMC and the halting and trading of DTCC because it's instantaneous settlement, um, lower costs, yeah. an immutable record, so which should benefit the regulators. Well, on the subject of regulation, something we were just speaking with Jesse Powell of Kraken about, and stable coins in particular, there has been a lot of scrutiny and yet no real action. Do you have to see the action in order to have real conviction in these markets and in these assets? Uh, great, great question. I, you know, yeah, crypto's a fun, I've been in crypto for about uh, five years. I was a skeptic for the first year. I'm a big believer. Uh, Bitcoin, ETH, stable coins, I believe, are the future. They're not going away. Uh, this tornado cash um, uh, uh, issue that's come up is a real issue. It's a blender, if, for those who don't understand. So really, it makes um, wallets uh, anonymous and uh, could, lead to, uh, could lead to nefarious uh, uh, parties utilizing it. Which or is just to privacy. Privacy, yes, right. that's a whole. Uh, you it know, could we, lead to just you living your own life. Absolutely, and I, I do know you've been in the uh, in crypto for about over ten years. So, so that's how it started. But we're regulatory compliance forward, so that's always our approach. And in regards to the regulatory framework, um, you know, I, I, there were analogies in your previous segment regarding cars. But the way I view it is that uh, the current regulatory environment not only for cryptos, but really for digital securities and, and what's occurred with Coinbase naming nine, uh, the SEC naming nine tokens as securities, is right now we're a Ferrari with training wheels. Mm -hmm. And the training wheels are tied to the regulators. And eventually those training wheels will be taken off and everybody will benefit. The market democratization, fractionalization, trad five firms are moving into this space in terms of the benefits of DeFi, but it's gonna take time. We're, we're very early. All right, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us here in our New York studio, Pat Lavecchia, CEO of Oasis Pro Markets. Thanks. And be sure to check out our Bloomberg Crypto podcast as well. It dives deeper than the daily market buzz to explore how this asset class is changing the way we live. Look for that every week through the Bloomberg Professional app, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Limes. Let's get to some of the crypto stories that caught our eye this week. Around $1.9 billion worth of digital tokens have been stolen in hacks this year. That's up 58% from the same period last year, according to a report from Chain Analysis. DeFi protocols have emerged as one of crypto's weakest links after targeting from state-sponsored hacking groups from North Korea. Do Kwon, co-inventor of the failed Terra stablecoin system, says South Korean authorities have not been in touch with him. Prosecutors opened a probe into allegations of illegal activity behind Terra's collapse and last week raided the home of co-founder Daniel Shin. Kwon said he plans to cooperate when the time comes. And crypto custody firm BitGo is seeking a $100 million termination fee from Mike Novogratz's Galaxy Digital. Galaxy says it is ending the $1.2 billion acquisition deal after BitGo failed to deliver financial statements. BitGo says it has since attracted an all-cash offer that exceeds Galaxy's deal, but may instead opt for an IPO. And oh, by the way, it says they did deliver those audited financial statements from 2021. Yeah, definitely quite the dispute. And I love how this show came full circle because at the beginning we were talking about BitGo, BitGo and a, a fine it had received received due to sanctions violations. Now we're all going to wait and see if Jesse Powell eventually uh, talks about whether or not Treasury is investigating them on those Iran Iran sanctions and what kind of fine could come with that. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't seem like it would be a huge fine. BitGo only got fined $98,000 and BitPay was only fined $500,000 for more alleged sanctions violations than, than Kraken probably has. But it'll still be interesting. I think this fight with Galaxy Digital is going to be incredibly interesting to watch because Galaxy had a huge loss yeah, in the second more quarter. Than half, half a billion dollars. More than right? half a billion dollars. Yeah. And maybe that's why they've pulled out of the acquisition, although they say it's because they haven't got those statements and Bitco says they delivered them. Yeah, well, we'll have to see how Mike Novogratz handles this one going forward. I have a feeling that it's not going to be wrapped up nice and neatly in a bow with them pursuing that termination fee. That's going to wrap it up for Bloomberg Crypto this week. But coming up on next week's show, we're going to focus on Bitcoin mining. We'll be talking with Iris Energy board member Mike Alfred and Chamber of Digital Commerce founder and president Perry Ann Boring. We'll be back same time, same place next week, Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern time, right here on Bloomberg.